Part the First, Chapter the Ninth. At four o'clock, conscious of his throbbing heart, Levin stepped out of a hired sledge at the zoological gardens, and turned along the path to the frozen mounds and the skating ground, knowing that he would certainly find her there, as he had seen the Shetabatsky's carriage at the entrance. It was a bright, frosty day. Rows of carriages, sledges, drivers, and policemen were standing in the approach. Crowds of well-dressed people with hats bright in the sun swarmed about the entrance and along the well-swept little paths between the little houses adorned with carving in the Russian style. The old curly birches of the gardens, all their twigs laden with snow, looked as though freshly decked in sacred vestments. He walked along the path towards the skating ground and kept saying to himself, "You mustn't be excited. You must be calm. What's the matter with you? What do you want? Be quiet, stupid!" He conjured his heart, and the more he tried to compose himself, the more breathless he found himself. An acquaintance met him and called him by his name, but Levin did not even recognize him. He went towards the mounds. Whence came the clank of the chains of sledges as they slipped down or were dragged up, the rumble of the sliding sledges, and the sounds of merry voices. He walked on a few steps, and the skating ground lay open before his eyes. And at once, amidst all the skaters, he knew her. He knew she was there by the rapture and the terror that seized on his heart. She was standing talking to a lady at the opposite end of the ground. There was apparently nothing striking either in her dress or her attitude, but for Levin she was as easy to find in that crowd as a rose among nettles. Everything was made bright by her. She was the smile that shed light on all round her. Is it possible that I can go over there on the ice, go up to her? He thought. The place where she stood seemed to him a holy shrine, unapproachable, and there was one moment when he was almost retreating. So overwhelmed was he with terror. He had to make an effort to master himself and to remind himself that people of all sorts were moving about her, and that he too might come there to skate. He walked down for a long while, avoiding looking at her as at the sun. But seeing her as one does the sun, without looking. On that day of the week and at that time of day, people of one set, all acquainted with one another, used to meet on the ice. There were crack skaters there showing off their skills, and learners clinging to chairs with timid, awkward movements, boys and elderly people skating with hygienic motives. They seemed to Levin an elect band of blissful beings, because they were here near her. All the skaters, it seemed, with perfect self-possession, skated towards her, skated by her, even spoke to her, and were happy, quite apart from her, enjoying the capital ice and the fine weather. Nikolai Shetabatsky, Kitty's cousin, in a short jacket and tight trousers. Was sitting on a garden seat with his skates on. Seeing Levin, he shouted to him, "Ah, the first skater in Russia! Been here long? First-rate ice. Do put your skates on." I haven't got my skates," Levin answered, marveling at this boldness and ease in her presence, and not for one second losing sight of her, though he did not look at her. He felt as though the sun were coming near him. She was in a corner, and turning out her slender feet in their high boots with obvious timidity, she skated towards him. A boy in Russian dress, desperately waving his arms and bowed down to the ground, overtook her. She skated a little uncertainly, taking her hands out of the little muff that hung on a cord. She held them ready for emergency, and looking towards Levin, whom she had recognized, she smiled at him. And at her own fears. When she had got round the turn, she gave herself a push off with one foot, and skated straight up to Shetabatsky. 
Clutching at his arm, she nodded, smiling to Levin. She was more splendid than he had imagined her. When he thought of her, he could call up a vivid picture of her to himself, especially the charm of that little fair head, so freely set on the shapely girlish shoulders and so full of childish brightness and good humour. The childishness of her expression, together with the delicate beauty of her figure, made up her special charm, and that he fully realised. But what always struck him in her as something unlooked for was the expression of her eyes, soft, serene and truthful, and above all, her smile, which always transported Levin to an enchanted world where he felt himself softened and tender as he remembered himself in some days of his early childhood. Have you been here long? she said, giving him her hand. Thank you, she added, as he picked up the handkerchief that had fallen out of her muff. I? I not long. Yesterday. Uh, I mean today. I arrived, answered Levin, in his emotion, not at once understanding her question. I was meaning to come and see you, he said. And then, recollecting with what intention he was trying to see her, he was promptly overcome with confusion and blushed. I didn't know you could skate, and skate so well. She looked at him earnestly, as though wishing to make out the cause of his confusion. Your praise is worth having. The tradition is kept up here that you are the best of skaters, she said, with her little black-gloved hand brushing a grain of hoarfrost off her muff. Yes, I used once to skate with passion. I wanted to reach perfection. You do everything with passion, I think, she said, smiling. I should so like to see how you skate. Put on skates and let us skate together. Skate together? Can that be possible? thought Levin, gazing at her. I'll put them on directly, he said, and he went off to get skates. It's a long while since we've seen you here, sir, said the attendant, supporting his foot and screwing on the heel of the skate. Except you, there's none of the gentlemen first-rate skaters. Will that be all right? said he, tightening the strap. Oh, yes. Yes, make haste, please, answered Levin, with difficulty restraining the smile of rapture which would overspread his face. Yes, he thought, this now is life, this is happiness. Together, she said, let us skate together. Speak to her now, but that's just why I'm afraid to speak. Because I'm happy now, happy in hope anyway. And then? But I must, I must, I must! Away with weakness! Levin rose to his feet, took off his overcoat, and scurrying over the rough ice round the hut, came out on the smooth ice and skated without effort, as it were, by simple exercise of will, increasing and slackening speed and turning his course. He approached with timidity, but again her smile reassured him. She gave him her hand, and they set off side by side, going faster and faster, and the more rapidly they moved, the more tightly she grasped his hand. With you I should soon learn, I somehow feel confidence in you, she said to him. And I have confidence in myself when you are leaning on me, he said, but was at once panic-stricken at what he had said, and blushed. And indeed, no sooner had he uttered these words, when all at once, like the sun going behind a cloud, her face lost all its friendliness, and Levin detected the familiar change in her expression that denoted the working of thought. A crease showed on her smooth brow. Is there anything troubling you? Though I've no right to ask such a question, he added hurriedly. Oh, why so? No, I have nothing to trouble me, she responded coldly. And she added immediately, You haven't seen Mademoiselle Linon, have you? Not yet. Go and speak to her. She likes you so much. What's wrong? I have offended her. Lord, help me, thought Levin. And he flew towards the old Frenchwoman with the grey ringlets who was sitting on a bench. Smiling and showing her false teeth, 
she greeted him as an old friend. Yes, you see, we're growing up, she said to him, glancing towards Kitty. And growing old, Tiny Bear has grown big now, pursued the French woman, laughing. And she reminded him of his joke about the three young ladies whom he had compared to the three bears in the English nursery tale. Do you remember that's what you used to call them? He remembered absolutely nothing. But she had been laughing at the joke for ten years now, and was fond of it. Now, go and skate, go and skate. Our kitty has learned to skate nicely, hasn't she? When Levin darted up to Kitty, her face was no longer stern. Her eyes looked at him with the same sincerity and friendliness. But Levin fancied that in her friendliness there was a certain note of deliberate composure, and he felt depressed. After talking a little of her old governess and her peculiarities, she questioned him about his life. Surely you must be dull in the country in the winter, aren't you? she said. No, I am not dull, I am very busy, he said, feeling that she was holding him in check by her composed tone, which he would not have the force to break through, just as it had been at the beginning of the winter. Are you going to stay in town long? Kitty questioned him. I don't know, he answered, not thinking of what he was saying. The thought that if he were held in check by her tone of quiet friendliness, he would end by going back again without deciding anything came into his mind, and he resolved to make a struggle against it. How is it you don't know? I don't know. It depends upon you, he said, and was immediately horror-stricken at his own words. Whether it was that she had not heard his words, or that she did not want to hear them, she made a sort of stumble, twice struck out, and hurriedly skated away from him. She skated up to Mademoiselle Linon, said something to her, and went towards the pavilion where the ladies took off their skates. My God, what have I done? Merciful God, help me, guide me, said Levin, praying inwardly, and at the same time feeling a need of violent exercise, he skated about describing inner and outer circles. At that moment, one of the young men, the best of the skaters of the day, came out of the coffee-house in his skates, with a cigarette in his mouth. Taking a run, he dashed down the steps in his skates, crashing and bounding up and down. He flew down, and without even changing the position of his hands, skated away over the ice. Ah, that's a new trick, said Levin, and he promptly ran up to the top to do this new trick. Don't break your neck! It needs practice! Nikolai Shutabatsky shouted after him. Levin went to the steps, took a run from above as best he could, and dashed down, preserving his balance in this unwanted movement with his hands. At, on the last step, he stumbled, but barely touching the ice with his hand, with a violent effort recovered himself and skated off, laughing. How splendid, how nice he is, Kitty was thinking at that time, as she came out of the pavilion with Mademoiselle Linon, and looked towards him with a smile of quiet affection, as though he were a favourite brother. And can it be my fault? Can I have done anything wrong? They talk of flirtation. I know it's not he that I love, but still I am happy with him, and he's so jolly. Only why did he say that? she mused. Catching sight of Kitty going away and her mother meeting her at the steps, Levin, flushed from his rapid exercise, stood still and pondered a minute. He took off his skates and overtook the mother and daughter at the entrance of the gardens. Delighted to see you, said Princess Shetabetskaya. On Thursdays we are at home, as always. Today, then? We shall be pleased to see you, the princess said stiffly. This stiffness hurt Kitty, and she could not resist the desire to smooth over her mother's coldness. She turned her head and with a smile said, Goodbye till this evening. 
At that moment, Stepan Arkadyevich, his hat cocked on one side with beaming face and eyes, strode into the garden like a conquering hero. But as he approached his mother-in-law, he responded in a mournful and crestfallen tone to her inquiries about Dolly's health. After a little subdued and dejected conversation with his mother-in-law, he threw out his chest again and put his arm in Levin's. Well, shall we set off? he asked. I've been thinking about you all this time, and I'm very, very glad you've come, he said, looking him in the face with a significant air. Yes, come along, answered Levin, in ecstasy, hearing unceasingly the sound of that voice saying, Goodbye till this evening, and seeing the smile with which it was said. To the England or the Hermitage? I don't mind which. All right, then, the England, said Stepan Arkadyevich, selecting that restaurant because he owed more there than at the Hermitage and consequently considered it mean to avoid it. Have you got a sledge? That's first rate, for I sent my carriage home. The friends hardly spoke all the way. Levin was wondering what that change in Kitty's expression had meant, and alternately assuring himself that there was hope and falling into despair, seeing clearly that his hopes were insane, and yet all the while he felt himself quite another man, utterly unlike what he had been before her smile and those words, goodbye till this evening. Stepan Arkadyevich was absorbed during the drive in composing the menu of the dinner. "'You like turbot, don't you?' he said to Levin as they were arriving. "'Eh?' responded Levin. "'Uh, turbot. Yes, I'm awfully fond of turbot.' Chapter the Tenth When Levin went into the restaurant with Oblonsky, he could not help noticing a certain peculiarity of expression, as it were a restrained radiance about the face and whole figure of Stepan Arkadyevich. Oblonsky took off his overcoat, and with his hat over one ear, walked into the dining room, giving directions to the Tatar waiters, who were clustered about him in evening coats, bearing napkins. Bowing to the right and left to the people he met, and here as everywhere joyously greeting acquaintances, he went up to the sideboard for a preliminary appetizer of fish and vodka, and said to the painted Frenchwoman decked in ribbons, lace and ringlets behind the counter, something so amusing that even that Frenchwoman was moved to genuine laughter. Levin, for his part, refrained from taking any vodka, simply because he felt such a loathing of that Frenchwoman, all made up, it seemed, of false hair, poudre de riz and vinaigre de toilette, he made haste to move away from her, as from a dirty place. His whole soul was filled with memories of Kitty, and there was a smile of triumph and happiness shining in his eyes. This way, Your Excellency, please. Your Excellency won't be disturbed here, said a particularly pertinacious white-haired old Tatar, with immense hips and coattails gaping widely behind. Walk in, Your Excellency, he said to Levin, by way of showing his respect to Stepan Arkadyevich, being attended to his guest as well. Instantly flinging a fresh cloth over the round table under the bronze chandelier, though it had already had a tablecloth on it, he pushed up velvet chairs and came to a standstill before Stepan Arkadyevich with a napkin and a bill of fare in his hands, awaiting his commands. If you prefer it, Your Excellency, a private room will be free directly. Prince Golenstein is with a lady. Fresh oysters have come in. Ah, oysters. Stepan Arkadyevich became thoughtful. How if we were to change our programme, Levin, he said, keeping his finger on the bill of fare, and his face expressed serious hesitation. Are the oysters good? Mind now. They're Flensburg, Your Excellency. We've no Ostend. Flensburg will do, but are they fresh? Only arrived yesterday. Well then, how if we were to begin with oysters and so change the whole programme, eh? It's all the same to me. I should like cabbage soup and porridge better than anything, but of course there's nothing like that here. 
Porridge a la Russe, your honour would like, said the Tatar, bending down to Levin like a nurse speaking to a child. No, joking apart, whatever you choose is sure to be good. I've been skating and I'm hungry. And don't imagine, he added, detecting a look of dissatisfaction on Oblonsky's face, that I shan't appreciate your choice. I am fond of good things. I should hope so. After all, it's one of the pleasures of life, says Stepan Arkadyevich. Well then, my friend, you give us two, or better say three dozen oysters, clear soup with vegetables, printanier, prompted the Tatar, but Stepan Arkadyevich apparently did not care to allow him the satisfaction of giving the French names of the dishes, with vegetables in it, you know, then turbot with thick sauce, then roast beef, and mind it's good, yes, and capons, perhaps, and then sweets. The Tatar, recollecting that it was Stepan Arkadyevich's way not to call the dishes by the names in the French bill of fare, did not repeat them after him, but could not resist rehearsing the whole menu to himself according to the bill. Soup à printanière, turbo sauce boche marchaise, poulard à l'estragon, macédoine de fruits, etc. And then Instantly, as though worked by springs, laying down one bound bill of fare, he took up another, the list of wines, and submitted it to Stepan Arkadyevich. What shall we drink? What you like, only not too much. Champagne, said Levin. What? To start with? You're right, though, I dare say. Do you like the white seal? Caché blanc, prompted the Tatar. Very well, then. Give us that brand with the oysters, and then we'll see. Yes, sir. And what table wine? You can give us Nuit. Oh, no, better the classic Chablis. Yes, sir. And your cheese, Your Excellency? Oh, yes, Parmesan. Or would you like another? No, it's all the same to me, said Levin, unable to suppress a smile. And the Tatar ran off with flying coattails, and in five minutes darted in with a dish of opened oysters on mother-of-pearl shells and a bottle between his fingers. Stepan Arkadyevich crushed the starchy napkin, tucked it into his waistcoat, and settling his arms comfortably, started on the oysters. Not bad, he said, stripping the oysters from the pearly shell with a silver fork and swallowing them one after another. Not bad, he repeated, turning his dewy, brilliant eyes from Levin to the Tatar. Levin ate the oysters indeed, though white bread and cheese would have pleased him better. But he was admiring Oblonsky. Even the Tatar, uncorking the bottle and pouring the sparkling wine into the delicate glasses, glanced at Stepan Arkadyevich and settled his white cravat with a perceptible smile of satisfaction. You don't care much for oysters, do you? said Stepan Arkadyevich, emptying his wine glass. Or you're worried about something, eh? He wanted Levin to be in good spirits. But it was not that Levin was not in good spirits. He was ill at ease. With what he had in his soul, he felt sore and uncomfortable in the restaurant, in the midst of private rooms where men were dining with ladies, in all this fuss and bustle the surroundings of bronzes, looking-glasses, gas and waiters, all of it was offensive to him. He was afraid of sullying what his soul was brimful of. I? Yes, I am. But besides, all this bothers me, he said. You can't conceive how queer it all seems to a country person like me, as queer as that gentleman's nails I saw at your place. Yes, I saw how much interested you were in poor Grinovich's nails, says Stepan Arkadyevich, laughing. It's too much for me, responded Levin. Do try now and put yourself in my place. Take the point of view of a country person. We in the country try to bring our hands into such a state as will be most convenient for working with. So we cut our nails. Sometimes we turn up our sleeves. And here... People purposely let their nails grow as long as they will, and link on small sources by way of studs, so that they can do nothing with their hands. Stepan Arkadyevich smiled gaily. Oh yes, that's just a sign that he has no need to do coarse work. 
His work is with the mind. Maybe, but still, it's queer to me. Just as at this moment it seems queer to me that we country folks try to get our meals over as soon as we can, so as to be ready for our work. While here we are, trying to drag out our meal as long as possible, and with that object, eating oysters. Why, of course, objected Stepan Arkadyevich. But that's just the aim of civilization, to make everything a source of enjoyment. Well, if that's its aim, I'd rather be a savage. And so you are a savage. All you Levins are savages. Levin sighed. He remembered his brother Nikolai and felt ashamed and sore, and he scowled. But Oblonsky began speaking of a subject which at once drew his attention. Oh, I say, are you going tonight to our people, the Shetabatskis, I mean? He said, his eyes sparkling significantly as he pushed away the empty rough shells and drew the cheese towards him. Yes, I shall certainly go, replied Levin, though I fancied the princess was not very warm in her invitation. What nonsense! That's her manner. Come, boy, the soup! That's her manner. Grand dam, said Stepan Arkadyevich. I'm coming too, but I have to go to the Countess Bonina's rehearsal. Come! Isn't it true that you're a savage? How do you explain the sudden way in which you've vanished from Moscow? The Shetabatskis were continually asking me about you, as though I ought to know. The only thing I know is that you always do what no one else does. Yes, said Levin, slowly and with emotion. You're right. I am a savage. Only my savageness is not in having gone away, but in coming now. Now I have come. Oh, what a lucky fellow you are, broke in Stepan Arkadyevich, looking into Levin's eyes. Why? I know a gallant steed by token sure, and by his eyes I know a youth in love, declaimed Stepan Arkadyevich. Everything is before you. Why, is it over for you already? No, not over exactly, but the future is yours and the present is mine. And the present, well, it's not all that it might be. How so? Oh, things go wrong. But I don't want to talk of myself, and besides I can't explain it all, said Stepan Arkadyevich. Well, why have you come to Moscow then? Hi, take away, he called to the Tatar. You guess, responded Levin, his eyes like deep wells of light fixed on Stepan Arkadyevich. I guess, but I can't be the first to talk about it. You can see by that whether I guess right or wrong, said Stepan Arkadyevich, gazing at Levin with a subtle smile. Well, and what have you to say to me, said Levin in a quivering voice, feeling that all the muscles of his face were quivering too. How do you look at the question? Stepan Arkadyevich slowly emptied his glass of Chablis, never taking his eyes off Levin. I, said Stepan Arkadyevich, there's nothing I desire so much as that, nothing. It would be the best thing that could be. But you're not making a mistake. You know what we're speaking of, said Levin, piercing him with his eyes. You think it's possible? I think it's possible. Why not possible? No. Do you really think it's possible? No, tell me all you think. Oh, but if... If refusal's in store for me... Indeed, I feel sure. Why should you think that? said Stepan Arkadyevich, smiling at his excitement. It seems so to me sometimes. That will be awful for me. And for her, too. Oh, well, anyway, there's nothing awful in it for a girl. Every girl's proud of an offer. Yes, every girl, but not she. Stepan Arkadyevich smiled. He so well knew that feeling of Levin's that for him all the girls in the world were divided into two classes. One class, all the girls in the world except her, and those girls with all sorts of human weaknesses and very ordinary girls. The other class, she alone, 
having no weaknesses of any sort and higher than all humanity. Stay, take some sauce, he said, holding back Levin's hand as it pushed away the sauce. Levin obediently helped himself to sauce, but would not let Stepan Arkadyevich go on with his dinner. No, stop a minute, stop a minute, he said. You must understand that it's a question of life and death for me. I have never spoken to anyone of this, and there's no one I could speak of it to, except you. You know we're utterly unlike each other, different tastes and views and everything, but I know you're fond of me, and understand me, and that's why I like you awfully. But for God's sake, be quite straightforward with me. I tell you what I think, said Stepan Arkadyevich, smiling, but I'll say more. My wife is a wonderful woman. Stepan Arkadyevich sighed, remembering his position with his wife, and after a moment's silence resumed, She has a gift of foreseeing things. She sees right through people. But that's not all. She knows what will come to pass, especially in the way of marriages. She foretold, for instance, that Princess Shahovskaya would marry Brenthelm. No one would believe it, but it came to pass. And she's on your side. How do you mean? It's not only that she likes you, she says that Kitty is certain to be your wife. At these words, Levin's face suddenly lighted up with a smile, a smile not far from tears of emotion. She says that, cried Levin. I always said she was exquisite, your wife. There, that's enough. Enough said about it, he said, getting up from his seat. All right, but do sit down. But Levin could not sit down. He walked with his firm tread twice up and down the little cage of a room, blinked his eyelids that his tears might not fall, and only then sat down at the table. You must understand, said he, it's not love. I've been in love. But it's not that. It's not my feeling, but a sort of force outside me has taken possession of me. I went away, you see, because I made up my mind that it could never be, you understand, as a happiness that does not come on earth, but I've struggled with myself. I see there's no living without it, and it must be settled. What did you go away for? Ah, uh, stop a minute. The thoughts that come crowding on one, the questions one must ask oneself. Listen, you can't imagine what you've done for me by what you said. I'm so happy that I've become positively hateful. I've forgotten everything. I heard today that my brother Nikolai, you know, he's here. I had even forgotten him. It seems to me that he's happy too. It's a sort of madness. But one thing's awful. Here, you've been married. You know the feeling. It's awful that we, old, with a past, not of love but of sins, are brought all at once so near to a creature pure and innocent. It's loathsome, and that's why one can't help feeling oneself unworthy. Oh well, you've not many sins on your conscience. Alas, all the same, said Levin, when with loathing I go over my life. I shudder and curse and bitterly regret it. Yes. What would you have? The world's made so, said Stepan Arkadyevich. The one comfort is like that prayer which I always liked. Forgive me not according to my unworthiness, but according to thy loving kindness. That's the only way she can forgive me. Chapter the Eleventh Levin emptied his glass, and they were silent for a while. There's one other thing I ought to tell you. Do you know Vronsky? Stepan Arkadyevich asked Levin. No, I don't. Why do you ask? Give us another bottle, Stepan Arkadyevich directed the Tatar, who was filling up their glasses and fidgeting round them just when he was not wanted. Why you ought to know Vronsky is that he's one of your rivals. Who's Vronsky? said Levin, and his face was suddenly transformed from the look of childlike ecstasy which Oblonsky had just been admiring to an angry and unpleasant expression. 
Vronsky is one of the sons of Count Kirill Ivanovich Vronsky and one of the finest specimens of the gilded youth of Petersburg. I made his acquaintance in Tver when I was there on official business, and he came there from the levy of recruits. Fearfully rich, handsome, great connections, an aide-de-camp, and with all that a very nice, good-natured fellow. But he's more than simply a good-natured fellow, as I found out here. He's a cultivated man too, and very intelligent. He's a man who'll make his mark. Levin scowled and was dumb. Well, he turned up here soon after you'd gone, and as I can see, he's over head and ears in love with Kitty. And you know that her mother... Excuse me, but I know nothing, said Levin, frowning gloomily. And immediately he recollected his brother Nikolai, and how hateful he was to have been able to forget him. You wait a bit, wait a bit, said Stepan Arkadyevich, smiling and touching his hand. I've told you what I know, and I repeat that in this delicate and tender matter, as far as one can conjecture, I believe the chances are in your favour. Levin dropped back in his chair. His face was pale. But I would advise you to settle the thing as soon as may be, pursued Oblonsky, filling up his glass. No thanks, I can't drink any more, said Levin, pushing away his glass. I shall be drunk. Come, tell me, how are you getting on? He went on, obviously anxious to change the conversation. One word more. In any case, I advise you to settle the question soon. Tonight I don't advise you to speak, said Stepan Arkadyevich. Go round tomorrow morning, make an offer in due form, and God bless you. Oh, do you still think of coming to me for some shooting? Come next spring, do, said Levin. Now his whole soul was full of remorse that he had begun this conversation with Stepan Arkadyevich. A feeling such as his was profaned by talk of the rivalry of some Petersburg officer, of the suppositions and the counsels of Stepan Arkadyevich. Stepan Arkadyevich smiled. He knew what was passing in Levin's soul. I'll come some day, he said. But women, my boy, there the pivot upon everything turns. Things are in a bad way with me, very bad, and it's all through women. Tell me frankly now, he pursued, picking up a cigar and keeping one hand on his glass. Give me your advice. Why? What is it? I'll tell you. Suppose you're married. You love your wife, but you're fascinated by another woman. Excuse me, but I'm com absolutely unable to comprehend how. Just as I can't comprehend how I could now, after my dinner, go straight to a baker's shop and steal a roll. Stepan Arkadyevich's eyes sparkled more than usual. Why not? A roll will sometimes smell so good one can't resist it. As he said this, Stepan Arkadyevich smiled subtly. Levin too could not help smiling. Yes, but joking apart, resumed Stepan Arkadyevich, you must understand that the woman is a sweet, gentle, loving creature, poor and lonely, and has sacrificed everything. Now... When the thing's done, don't you see, can one possibly cast her off? Even supposing one parts from her so as not to break up one's family life, still can one help feeling for her, setting her on her feet, softening her lot? Well, you must excuse me there. You know to me all women are divided into two classes. At least, no, truer to say, there are women and there are... I've never seen exquisite fallen beings, and I never shall see them. But such creatures as that painted Frenchwoman at the counter with the ringlets are vermin to my mind, and all fallen women are the same. But the Magdalene? Ah, drop that. Christ would never have said those words if he had known how they would be abused. Of all the gospel, those words are the only ones remembered. However, I'm not saying so much what I think, as what I feel. I have a loathing for fallen women. You're afraid of spiders, and I of these vermin. Most likely you've not made a study of spiders and don't know their character. And so it is with me. 
It's very well for you to talk like that. It's very much like that gentleman in Dickens who used to fling all difficult questions over his right shoulder. But to deny the facts is no answer. What's to be done? You tell me that. What's to be done? Your wife gets older while you're full of life. Before you've time to look round, you feel that you can't love your wife with love, however much you may esteem her. And then all at once love turns up and you're done for, done for, Stepan Arkadyevich said with weary despair. Levin half smiled. Yes, you're done for, resumed Oblonsky, but what's to be done? Don't steal rolls. Stepan Arkadyevich laughed outright. Oh, moralist! But you must understand, there are two women. One insists only on her rights, and those rights are your love, which you can't give her. And the other sacrifices everything for you and asks for nothing. What are you to do? How are you to act? There's a fearful tragedy in it. If you care for my profession of faith as regards that, I'll tell you that I don't believe there was any tragedy about it, and this is why. To my mind, love, both the sorts of love which you remember Plato defines in his banquet, served as the test of men. Some men only understand one sort, and some only the other. And those who only know the non-Platonic love have no need to talk of tragedy. In such love there can be no sort of tragedy. I'm much obliged for the gratification. My humble respects. That's all the tragedy. And in platonic love, there can be no tragedy, because in that love, all is clear and pure, because at that instant Levin recollected his own sins and the inner conflict he had lived through, and he added unexpectedly, But perhaps you are right. Very likely. I don't know. I don't know. It's this, don't you see, says Stepan Arkadyevich. You're very much all of a piece. That's your strong point and your failing. You have a character that's all of a piece, and you want the whole of life to be of a piece too. But that's not how it is. You despise public official work because you want the reality to be invariably corresponding all the while with the aim. And that's not how it is. You want a man's work too, always to have a defined aim, and love and family life always to be undivided, and that's not how it is. All the variety, all the charm, all the beauty of life is made up of light and shadow. Levin sighed and made no reply. He was thinking of his own affairs and did not hear Oblonsky. And suddenly both of them felt that though they were friends, though they had been dining and drinking together, which should have drawn them closer, yet each was thinking only of his own affairs, and they had nothing to do with one another. Oblonsky had more than once experienced this extreme sense of aloofness, instead of intimacy, coming on after dinner, and he knew what to do in such cases. Bill, he called, and he went into the next room, where he promptly came across an aide-de-camp of his acquaintance, and dropped into conversation with him about an actress and her protector. And at once in the conversation with the aide-de-camp, Oblonsky had a sense of relaxation and relief after the conversation with Levin, which always put him to too great a mental and spiritual strain. When the Tatar appeared with a bill for 26 rubles and odd kopecks, besides a tip for himself, Levin, who would another time have been horrified like anyone from the country at his share of 14 rubles, did not notice it, paid, and set off homewards to dress and go to the Shertobatskys, there to decide his fate. <laughs>